broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Everyone, welcome into the program. Today on the show, we have a great one for you, as always, because we have Ralph Bond. He is our science and tech trends correspondent. Love having him here. He's waiting oh so patiently in the wings. And yeah, uh, we have a number of stories for you. This is going to be a lot of fun. So everyone, uh, before we get started, ComputerAmerica.com. That's uh, always want to shout that out because that's where you'll find everything, including the show notes, which are huge, uh, but also links to our guest website, links to any articles, resources, anything that we talk about here, and just everything else that we do here at Computer America, including social media links. And uh, I think sometime early next week, mid next week, uh, we should be do uh, we should be kicking off a new giveaway. I'm hoping to, you know, start doing that monthly. We used to, we used to do that every single month, and uh, you know, I think it's time to bring that back. So keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on social media, and of course Twitter as well. And by the way, our guest actually has a great great Twitter as well. So you should be sure to follow Ralph Bond over on Twitter as well. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and bring the man of the hour on. And as I said before, longtime correspondent, science and tech, uh, science and technology trends. Ralph, how you doing? Welcome back onto the program. It's great to be back. And Ben, once again, another week for us to uplift people's spirits in this horrible, dark world we're living in with great <laughs> news from the science and technology community. So I love doing this every week. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, we have lots of great stories that, uh, you know, that we can talk about. But why don't we go ahead and, you know, kind of get a little bit of an overview of what you really look for when you pick these stories? Because, you know, again, a lot of these we have, well, I can almost guarantee you, we have not covered any of these on our regular program. Uh, Yeah. So I'm kind of an aggregator, meaning I kind of go out there and look at the different news services, the science news services and uh, uh, energy saving news services, all these kind of technology websites and so forth, and troll those news services for stories, as you point out, that kind of fly under the mainstream media radar, but are very significant in many cases. So I handpick those. I I don't compose this material myself uh, originally. It's just sort of like I say, I gather this material. I then try to put it into sort of a Reader's Digest condensed, humanized form so it's understandable and then bring it to the audience every week with you on Friday morning. So I hope this is going to be fun. I think it will be. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm really looking forward to this because a lot of what you have done here, as your title implies, is uh, green energy, medicine, you know, uh, space, a lot of space stuff. Right. I mean, it, it's right. all really fun. And um, yeah, I can't think of any other way to introduce this than just say, let's give them an example, Ralph, with story number yeah. one. Yes. Story number one comes from the United Kingdom's Daily Mail newspaper, which is a wonderful resource, of course. And the headline here is new all electric locomotive recharges itself using the force of gravity. And by the way, I also, in the spirit of Reader's Digest and simplifying and humanizing things, sometimes I'll modify the actual headline. So when you go to my show notes and you click on the link, the headline in the show notes might be different than what's actually published on the website. But again, Mm -hmm. I do this for the purpose of making it a little more accessible. So again, new all electric locomotive recharges itself using the force of gravity. Okay. You can't resist that story. So of course, you know, a few weeks ago, you and I talked about Union Pacific Railroad purchasing uh, about 20 or so all-electric locomotives as the first wave of their foray into this field. But Mm -hmm. like our electric cars, of course, those locomotives have to be recharged. But what if you never had to recharge? And that's the thing that made my brain just explode when I saw this story. So a team of scientists working for Australia's Fortescue Future Industries and UK-based battery maker Williams Advanced Engineering are developing the world's first all-electric locomotive with a battery that will be recharged by harnessing gravitational energy on downhill sections of a track. And I know that raises a lot of questions right off the top of the bat. What if you're 
doing a train across the great American plains where you barely have any right. you know, change in elevation, but we'll get to that later. So the friction of braking to slow the train will regenerate electricity and theoretically mean the locomotive could run indefinitely <laughs> without having to go out of service to recharge. It's crazy. So again, it raises a lot of questions, but it's, it's kind of a cool concept. And obviously these folks figured this is going to work or they wouldn't be doing this. And the team of experts uh, with this group expect this new locomotive to come to the market or be available later this decade. So it's not tomorrow, it's a future. So that's the trend aspect of what this story is all about. Now, Fortescue Future Industries announced their so-called Infinity Train project following its, its acquisition of their partner, UK-based battery firm, Williams Advanced Engineering. And together, the two companies will work to accelerate the transition to green energy and help the industry, the railroad industry, cut carbon emissions to zero by the end of the decade. That's their big goal. And then for fun, you know, a lot of the articles pointed out that this is sort of related to the fun sci-fi movie back in 2013, uh, the post-apocalyptic science fiction movie. The Snowpiercer, where the Earth is, has frozen and a train carrying survivors must stay in perpetual motion circling the globe. And so this could, <laughs> not that the, uh, God forbid, the uh, Earth freezes and so forth, but the idea of a perpetual train could be something that's a reality in the not too distant future. We'll see. Uh, but a lot of questions were raised in my mind and, and other folks that I've talked to about this story. What about areas where it's very flat? You know, mm -hmm. How does the train work in this kind of situation? That's a TBD. But I thought when I saw this story, let me explain. I live in the Portland, Oregon area, and we have something called the MAX, which is our light rail, all electric light rail commuter system. It has tracks that go all over the whole metro area, and it's really a lot of fun. Right. Um, and but, but it uses a traditional overhead power lines, right? And the trains have the little bit that goes up and connects with the wires and that's how the power is transmitted to the train right. but these little commuter trains are constantly like every five minutes of stopping at a little station so the regenerative energy of braking and so forth in this case i could see that working in that kind of situation long-haul freight trains that are going through areas that might be very flat hmm, tbd if you're going through the rocky mountains and you got a lot of you know inclines and so forth maybe that'll it'll work so there's a lot of Let's wait and see how this works out. But again, obviously, they would not be doing this work if they didn't think they had something that's viable. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, this is a technology that, um, you know, obviously has been using cars for a long time and electric cars right, right. to, to uh, you know, to some level of, of success. I guess adding it to trains, like, I, I guess the the bigger question here, because Ralph, like, it's one thing for like a car. And I'm sure that, yeah. you know, the, the, the electronics of it are one thing, but trains weigh a lot you know like there, there yeah. are tons and yeah. tons of weight behind them imagine how much energy you you actually have to not just transfer but capture at that exact moment like i guess that's really the right. hard part where you know before it was like you know oh, a car you could you know kind of do it this one it's this would be a major feat if they can get it done so that's amazing yeah yeah it is it's, it's encouraging so that's our first uplifting <laughs> story it's for first today. uplifting. By the way, that story ended with a uh, with with an apocalyptic scenario that it could be for, yes, um, yes. you know foreboding. But no, uh, story number one, story number two. Though we can go ahead and uh, Ralph, uh, are are you a fan of Arrested Development by any chance? Oh, I've I've yes, absolutely. <laughs> So there's a scene in Arrested Development where, um, you know, in um, I think it's like George Bluth Sr. is uh, is in prison and he touches someone and the, and the guard yells, no touching. And he's like, no touch. And he throws up his hands. <laughs> yes. This next one, I bring that up because, hey, it might be it's just built into the prison uniforms at some point. Oh, yeah, there's a lot. In fact, we'll jump to the very last comment I have about this story. Mm -hmm. Amazing possibilities, but we use that in this case as a tease for the story. Sure. Uh, this comes from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, their news outlet, their webpage for news, which is fabulous anyway. Uh, but this headline here that I created is scientists create a new fabric that can hear and emit sounds. What? Okay, <laughs> very interesting stuff. So engineers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and collaborators at the Rhode Island School of Design, that's an interesting collaboration, have created a fabric that works like a microphone. 
converting sound first into mechanical vibrations and then into electrical signals. This is really cool. All fabrics, uh, and I didn't, I never, ever, ever thought about this until I read this article. All mm -hmm. fabrics vibrate in response to audible sounds. But hmm. these vibrations, of course, these vibrations are far too weak to be heard or sensed in any way by us, right? So to capture these imperceptible vibrations, the MIT researchers created a flexible piezoelectric fiber. They then wove into an experimental fabric. Well, time out, piezoelectricity, what's this all about? So piezoelectricity is the electric charge that accumulates in certain materials when mechanical force or stress is applied to them. It is used in a number of different engineering, manufacturing, telecommunication, and computer systems that capture mechanically induced energy and transform it into electric power. So this piezoelectric fiber they created, which in turn they wove into an experimental fabric, is uh, one that uh, acts on the principles of piezoelectric or piezoelectricity. To me, that was a real, I love that it was a light bulb of learning for me when I read mm -hmm. this article. The piezoelectric material created by the MIT team produces an electrical signal when vibrated. So sounds hitting the fabric vibrates uh, the material, the piezoelectric fiber, and then in turn, you get this electric signal. So what do you do with it? As a result, their new experimental fabric can convert faint sound vibrations hitting the fabric into electrical signals. And I, at this point, you might be thinking, if you're listening to us, all right, well, that's cool, but is it just science for the sake of science or what's the benefit? Well, I love this part. According to the MIT team, this experimental fabric can imperceptibly interface with human skin. So imagine you're wearing a shirt, like I'm wearing a t-shirt right now. Mm -hmm. This means, for example, and this is my speculation, this was not in the article, you could have a t-shirt made with this new fabric linked to a smartphone that could monitor heart and respiratory conditions in a comfortable, continuous, real-time manner. And let me qualify what I just said about this is my speculation. The speculation on my part is the idea of making a t-shirt. In the article, they do talk about this technology being able to monitor heart and respiratory conditions and so forth. But again, as you pointed out earlier, the possibilities are amazing. And the fibers, <laughs> and here's the part that's just great, and, and, but there's more. And the fibers can also be made to generate sound, such as a recording of spoken words. The possibilities here are amazing. So to your point, um, <laughs> maybe somebody has a garment that if it's touched, they go, don't touch me. <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 to a much less uh, scientific and medical uh, application, absolutely. But yeah, you know, um, I, I like how, I'm sorry, I like where your mind jumps to with the t-shirt and, you know, the whole heart condition thing. I can immediately see something more like, uh, I don't know, maybe like uh, hospital gowns where you could put them on people, they could yes. constantly monitor, yes. and then of course they could feed that data into, you know, monitoring systems. There are so many possibilities. Uh, by the way, I wanted to look up, you know, kind of piezoelectric because that sounded yes. a lot like, um, you know, what you were just talking about in story number one. And I did find a research article, so I don't think all regenerative, uh, I'm sorry, I don't think all regenerative, regenerative, Okay. Yeah, the, the I'm with thing, you there. I can't I, say I, it either. <laughs> I don't think regenerative, regenerative breaking is uh, uses piezoelectric material, but I have found some articles that do combine the two. So I was yeah. like, hmm, those two sound very similar. Like clearly, you were on an energy kick. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if it was the coffee <laughs> or what, but uh, electricity <laughs> is the name of the game with a lot of these. And well, really, I, I, yeah. And Ben, by the way, as you were speaking. I just, bing, we can be billionaires. Okay, here's how it I'm happens. ready. I've been taking care of, like many grandparents in the COVID era, uh, my wife and I have been babysitting our, our respective uh, four, four grandchildren. And That's one handful. of them is, yeah, one of them is nine months old. So diapers, of course, are a huge part of our life. You can see where I'm going with this, I think. Mm -hmm. What if this piezoelectric fiber could be incorporated into diapers? <laughs> so when there's moisture or solid material in the mm -hmm. diaper, there's uh, some way to communicate. Of course, it would have to be sound induced. Well, if there's enough sound, maybe with the biological <laughs> acting question, it could trigger the piezoelectric fiber, which in turn could communicate to my smartphone, what diaper, what diaper. <laughs>
And then, of course, it could give so much more data. It could give consistency. It could give everything. But no. uh, And and then, of course, on top of that, Ralph, we'll we'll have to work on the marketing because I think uh, the 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 benefit of making um, you know newborns and toddlers more noise inducing is uh might be a little bit hard to sell to parents but we'll work on it and i can't wait to be a a billionaire again it's going to be great uh so there you go story number two and 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 again just kind of shows the possibility like and you know uh so many so many of these like i know that we've done stories kind of like this that are smart garments and they've been used in uh athletics for training purposes and things like that there's so many there's so many different ways that you could um you know use this so story number two, uh, perfect. Story number three, let's go ahead and talk about this. And by the way, just so everyone knows, um, actually, I'm going to talk about the nose here just for a second. Um, smelling things is actually like humans are very, very good at it. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you know this, Ralph, but humans can distinguish between about one trillion with a T, one trillion different odors, if not more, which makes our noses the, the most sensitive organ in our body than any other organ so better than yeah. hear sight whatever we smell really good but even we can't do what apparently ants and you know dogs have been able to do for quite a while yep. so story number three yep. yeah yeah this is really fun so the headline here is new research shows ants the little ant guys can sniff out cancer in humans This is another story I picked up from the UK's Daily Mail. They do some great science coverage, by the way. And you can see the illustration there of the ant in question and some of the uh, experimental information on the chart that's next to the picture in the show notes. And by the way, friends, if if you're listening to us, and uh, please come back and get the show notes because it has the links, the pictures, and everything that will give you the opportunity. And this is a good point to to go more in depth because a lot of times, as I said at the outset of today's show, I kind of condense things down to a super simplified form. There's so much more information, so much more science behind mm-hmm. every one of these articles that you can go and learn about. But with that said, when it comes to using animals to sniff out cancer, I think a lot of us are aware that dogs have been a go-to animal to date. But here's the deal. Training a dog to sniff out cancer in humans can take up to a year. That's a lot of time and investment, right? Yeah. So here's the fun, here's the really fun twist. Researchers from the French National Center for Scientific Research have discovered a much less expensive and faster alternative. Ants. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in specific a species of ant with a super sense of smell called Formica fusca. And the Formica part threw me off because I'm old enough to remember Formica countertops, right? In the 50s and the 60s. But anyway, these ants, Formica fusca, which are found in Europe, Southern Asia, and Africa. In the French team's experiments, the ants were able to differentiate cancerous cells from healthy cells in humans. So how did they do this? First, the researchers exposed the ants to the smell of cancerous human cells. This odor was then associated with a reward of sugar solution, which the ants mm. just go nuts for. It's, it's like their cocaine. And <laughs> if you want to stop for a second, a little science history segue, you may have already figured this out, but this is exactly what Pavlov's dog experiments were all about. And if you're not familiar with that, real quick here, a quick history lesson just for a moment. During the 1890s, Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov discovered that any object or event which the dogs learn to associate with food, such as, such as even a lab assistant who was tri- charged with feeding the animals, would trigger the same response. In other words, the desire to... Um, perform a task associated with the desire for food. So he realized he had made an important scientific discovery. So Pavlovian dogs, sometimes people will say, oh, that's your, you've trained your husband or wife to do something (laughs) that's like Pavlov's dogs or your kids more accurately. So associating a positive thing with 
doing a task. Like we told our grandson, if you let Vicky, our next door neighbor, cut your hair, we'll take you to Costco for an ice cream sundae. <laughs> That's a very Pavlovian thing, right? Now he associates it's, haircuts with that. <laughs> no, and hey, it's also great parenting advice. Yeah, it's uh, something that I think comes up a lot in uh, technology as well. I, I think tech companies have done an amazing job of adapting it <laughs> thanks to the little, you know, bell ringing and notifications that your phone does with, yes. you know, hey, you know, just uh, here's your reward. And it's a little hit of dopamine <laughs> when someone texts you, when you get a notification about news, yeah. technology uses all the time. But in ants, I've never like I did not think it, ants were smart enough to do that. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. And that's a part of what makes the story so fascinating. So we'll go back to our story here. So back to our French experiments with the ants in a second step, the researchers exposed the ants to two different odors. One was a new smell. And the second was the smell of cancerous cells. So again, they're trying to test the viability of this associative uh, cancer cell associated with the sugar solution, right? So after a series of successful training sessions, the researchers exposed the ants to a variety of cancerous cells. So now the question was, we could get them to associate the sugar solution reward with sci or cancer cell type A, let's say. Would it work with type B, C, D, E, F, whatever, right? And that was what they did. They expanded the exposure experiment. So the scientists found that these Formica fusca ants can discriminate between cancers and healthy cells and even between two cancerous lines and actually even more than two. But here's the reality check. Mm -hmm. uh, the researchers, in fairness, the researchers did say this. Uh, the research team noted that more clinical tests using humans with and without cancer must be carried out before the ants could be used in a clinical setting like a hospital. So they're saying, you know, this is just initial research we're sharing with the world. We need to do more testing before we release these things. And then I have to think <laughs> to myself, someday I'm lying in the ER or I'm in a hospital or something like that, God forbid, again. Um, and they come in with a little box of ants and they go, Ralph, you know what we're going to do here? We're going to let these ants crawl all over you and see if they detect any <laughs> cancer. And I was joking with a friend of mine who I was telling him about this story. And I said, well, I with Mark Mason over KEX radio, we were talking about this story. And I, I said, Mark, I think you'd have to be sedated. You'd have to put people <laughs> under or something to let these guys crawl all over you because you'd just be swatting at them. Right? <laughs> it's like, but, no, don't. But pretty great. <laughs> it's like, please, no, don't kill that ant. He's a healthcare professional. He, he's, 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 he's highly trained. <laughs> don't kill him. Uh, uh, but, uh, but of course, my, my question, Ralph, is, uh, and, you know, I might need to look up this specific ant, the, uh, the Formica uh, Fusca. Fusca. Yeah. Um, how long do ants live? Because, you know, I'm looking here, some ants live four to 12 months, some live four years. I had no idea. Um, yeah. Like, I, I know it's one thing to say a dog takes a year to train, but then hopefully the dog, you know, fingers well, crossed, lives a good, you know, 10, 12 year lifespan. That's um, a great point. You know, if each, I'm sorry, if each ant has to be trained, you know, for a couple of days, let's say it's very, very quick, uh, but then they only live a couple of weeks. I mean, that's extremely labor intensive. Well, that's a that's an excellent point that no one's brought up, and I think you're right on target with that. So it's this could be in the area of wacky science and just kind of fun and interesting. On a side note, maybe there's other creatures that could be trained quicker than dogs that would be less expensive that would have a longer duration. <laughs> yeah, you raise a good point. Yeah, maybe, uh, <laughs> but but of course they have that they have to have that amazing sense of smell. So uh, yeah, doctor mm. ants. That's that's something yep. uh, completely different. And, yep. and, and and actually to uh, to even rebut the whole them crawling all over you thing, uh, Ralph. <laughs> in my head, uh, I'll be honest. I never even thought of that. I was thinking more like uh, uh, not cultures, but uh, uh, biopsies. You know, like they take material and then they put it under a microscope. That's when they would put the ants near it. They wouldn't just be like, here's some ants. And then, of course, you know, then you oh, have I to see where you're out. going. OK, yeah. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. So, so maybe not have people crawling with ants. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that aside, uh, our last story is going to get a little bit uh, back into the energy side of things. And, yep. you know, um, people I, and, and it, the question came up so often, Ralph, on, on the show that I uh, and actually, by the way, real quick, ants live seven to 10 years, four to 12 years, 15 years. Uh, OK, so ants might actually live a long time. So that's OK. Anyways, uh, this topic came up so often. We actually have an article still on our site buried somewhere. You can find it. Um, but it's about why aren't there any new batteries like, you know, we keep hearing about battery breakthrough, battery breakthrough. And, you know. 
actually improve like you know we've been uh, marginally improving lithium ion batteries for so long we've like yes. perfected that technology nothing else right. really compares like lithium ion is amazing and you know that's why you know we're gonna do the story and i hope this is the breakthrough but i mean yeah uh Science has really nailed batteries and, you know, they can only go up from here. But what is that new? What does that new step look like? And hopefully story number four is that next step. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I think what we're going to see in story number four is an incremental step, a promising good step forward, mainly for safety. And let me explain the headline here is scientists discover promising new electrolyte for solid state lithium ion batteries. So we'll get into this. I got this from SciTech Daily. Uh, it was a spinoff story from the Argonne National Laboratory news release. And also I went out and looked at the University of Waterloo in Canada where this uh, research is taking place. So there's two links there for you in the show notes. But let's get into this. First, let's set the stage for this. In the quest for the perfect battery, scientists have two primary goals, create a device that can store a great deal of energy and do it safely. This story really reminded me of the safety factor here with our lithium ion batteries. So most lithium ion batteries today use a semi-liquid paste as the electrolyte that transports electrons back and forth between the anode and cathode, or in super simple terms, meaning between the positive and negative electrodes in a battery. Mm -hmm. So the problem with conventional lithium ion batteries is that the semi-liquid paste electrolyte can catch fire if it gets too hot. I forgot about this. Little problem. This is a, this is a you know, not, not great. In response, the world scientists are racing to develop solid state lithium ion batteries that will offer a combination of higher safety and increased energy storage capacity. And to achieve this goal, and, the, and again, they're going to try to achieve, achieve this goal using something other than a semi-liquid flammable paste electrolyte. Sounds like a good idea. So recently, a very encouraging step forward was announced by scientists at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And the university's new all-solid-state battery uses an innovative alternative electrolyte composed of lithium, scandium, indium, and chlorine. And there's a little illustration in the show notes of, of this uh, molecular uh, entity, <laughs> this electrolyte. The right. chlorine... The chlorine nature of the electrolyte is key to its stability at operating conditions above four volts, meaning it's suitable for typical cathode materials that form the mainstay of today's lithium ion cells. So there's so much more science in the article. We're just really skipping a stone over the surface. But the big takeaway, and this is, this is uh, as follows, and this new electrolyte in their experimental solid state lithium ion battery is not only much safer, it also works without significantly losing storage capacity over a hundred cycles at high voltage and thousands of cycles at intermediate voltage. So it's got a kind of a win-win scenario, but the main thing is a safer lithium ion battery. So, you know, it's a step forward and salute to our friends in Canada for coming up with this and we'll see if this takes off and gets deployed. Yeah, and and of course, fire, uh, you know, fire safety and hazards are uh, quickly becoming a huge, huge issue. Like I, I know that there was okay. So uh, thinking back in the news that we've covered on the show, Ralph, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Okay, so there was the Tesla fire that happened last year uh, uh, down in Texas. Um, you yeah. know, it, it, it took like what was it like uh, one hundred and fifty thousand gallons of water to put out one uh. Uh, Tesla fire. Because, you know, you can pour water on a Tesla battery that's, you know, that, that's igniting just to kind of keep the temperature down, but you won't put it out because it's, it, it's a chemical reaction and, you know, it doesn't really need yep. anything else. So yep. you have car safety to think about. You have, uh, well, actually also car safety. There was that, there was that uh, shipping, uh, there was that shipping ship, I guess, that was shipping a uh, uh, okay, okay, that's enough ship. That was shipping Mercedes <laughs> Benz cars, I think, huh. and like a okay. hundred, it was like 150 or 200 uh, different high, you know, luxury 
uh, Mercedes cars all went up in smoke. And of course the ship had to be evacuated because of these things. Like this is why Ralph, like you're not allowed to pack your phones or anything with lithium batteries in your luggage or suitcase when you fly is because they're just so, you know, they're so fire prone. If they can fix that, Oh my God. Like our, no kidding. Our lives would be so much safer. And I think the world really would be a better place because you could save on shipping costs. You could save on safety. You could save on so much. I hope they figured this out because safety is a huge area of improvement. So yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You really raised the, raised the stakes of the importance of this story. I thank you for doing that because I hadn't thought about the bit about, you know, you can't take your, or pack your uh, lithium ion battery based equipment or phone or whatever. Like I hadn't thought about that. You're right. You're right. It's such small things. Like, you know, if you have an electric toothbrush and you put, you know, you just throw it in your suitcase and, you know, you get on a plane, they'll confiscate it. You know, they'll take it and throw it away because it can't be in the whole of a plane. It it just, it just can't happen. Uh, there, There, there's a lot to think about there. And, uh, yeah, that is a great. great story to kind of end on because, <laughs> hey, again, if they get that working, everyone's going to be better off for it, which, hey, I think is a good theme for all of your stories, Ralph. If all these come to fruition, we are all better off for it, even yes. the infinite electricity train. So everyone, computeramerica.com, you can, of course, find that there with all the show notes, everything that we've talked about, including a link to Ralph's site. And yeah, everyone, um, and over on our uh, over on YouTube, actually, we have a whole section dedicated strictly to Ralph Bond. You can search by just Ralph Bond. And trust me, a lot of the stories are so research, experimental, and you know, fun that you can go back and and catch many shows with him it's been great so everyone until next time thank you so much and we'll catch you next time bye everyone